Oh, actually, the first thing I want to ask is, does anybody know what language this is? Um, Lord? Latin, right. And it's, at least where I come from, it was pronounced anus dei. Anyone know what that means? You said you looked it up. What does it mean? Right. And uh, in case you're wondering, yes, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And I'm sure we all know who that is. I like this song because it's it's nothing but praise. It's all about Jesus and not about us. And so um, the words you see there will be repeated a number of times. So a tune that you can pick up fairly quickly if you haven't sung it before. Let's pray. Well, Lord God, we may have various reasons for coming here today. We are very grateful for the day, and we really enjoy being with each other, especially when we're gathered here with you on the Sabbath. I just pray that our time here will be a blessing to us and will give glory to you. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Amen. Oh, the scripture reading today is 1 Samuel 2.27 through 1 Samuel 3.1. Then a man of God came to Eli and thus say the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up my altar, to be to burn incense and to wear an ephod, an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father and all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who will despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm, the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house, and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever." But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all those all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phineas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is what is my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before me, my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for bringing us together today. I thank you for this very blessed Sabbath and that we can spend it together. I'd like to sing your praises for healing uh, Becky's wrist. I pray um, that you would be with Jessica as she's celebrating her birthday. And Heavenly Father, I would ask that you would put your healing hands on Jim Lindsay, and I pray that you would cleanse his body of any um, illnesses and keep him healthy and safe. Please be with all of the Lindsays and all of our church members. I also ask that you would put your healing hands on John and Annie. I pray that you would keep them healthy and safe. And Lord, I pray for our entire church. I pray that you would help us to be a light and beacon in this community and uh, 
and for, for whoever we reach in our daily lives. And I pray that you would be with all the people around us that haven't found you yet. Please, Lord, reach out to them and help them to find you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. After that story that Priscilla read from 1 Samuel, I think we needed a happy story. That was not a happy story. You know, I really don't like reading sad words or depressing stories from the Bible. I don't suppose you do either. So why did I ask Priscilla to read that story? You know, God's Word is supposed to be good news. So I think a lot of us avoid the uh, depressing parts. I'm sorry to say that some of it is kind of sad. I hope we can find some good news in what we heard today. You know, part of the problem we uh, is that we have a hard time imagining what life was like for God's people back at the time that we just read about. Especially that last part where it said, the word of God was rare. Not many visions. You know, word of God, visions. At that time, it means pretty much the same thing. Because at that time, seeing visions and having dreams was one of the main ways of hearing from God. They didn't have a Bible like we have. And I believe that's why you find so many visions and dreams in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. So, as we read here in this story, if the visions have stopped, sounds like nobody's hearing from God. And if they're not hearing from God, they're probably not obeying Him or worshiping Him. Let's back up for a minute. I, I, ho I hope you still have that open. Uh, let's back up to what we read in chapter 2. You notice that this book is named after Samuel. And the next book, too. <laughs> uh, Samuel was born in, in chapter 1, and he's still just a kid in chapter 2. Now. Now, he was a great kid who would turn out to be a great adult. But at this point, the priest, Eli, was pretty much still the man in charge. And since Eli was sort of semi-retired, his two sons were the active priests, and they weren't doing a very good job of it. You know, corruption in high places. It's always a very sad thing. It happens in civil government. It seems like more and more all the time. You know, federal, state, county, in cities, even school districts. When corruption sets in, things go downhill quickly. Nations and empires have, have gone out of power even gone out of out of existence when immorality and corruption take over and some people think that our country is headed that way it's worse when it happens in the church <laughs> nothing makes the christian faith more unattractive than corruption or immorality in the leaders just one example and, of course, it's easier to talk about somebody else than talk about us. But just as one example, the Roman Catholic Church has struggled with immorality among priests for many years. The problem is certainly not limited to Catholics. Well, speaking of priests, we had priests here in 1 Samuel. Uh, Eli and his two sons. Hophni and Phineas. Obviously, these guys are not the same thing as modern Roman Catholic priests, because the Catholic priests, for one thing, 
they weren't supposed to have sons <laughs> because they can't be married. But the Jewish priests and rabbis have always been family men, and that's how God said it should be. In my opinion, that's a much better way to do it. You know, priests being married and having families, and of course, pastors too. But as we see here, corruption can still happen. Now, this story happened near the end of the Old Testament period of the Judges. You've heard of the Judges, two books before 1 Samuel. There's a book called Judges, and it describes the way that God used to, to uh, rule Israel. And it was a period of maybe three or four hundred years. These Judges were not kings. There was no family dynasty like kings usually have. God would just choose a judge whenever he needed one. And the judge could come from any tribe of Israel. And of course, it wasn't always men. One of the best of all the judges was a woman, Deborah. Sometimes I wonder if God wouldn't have liked to keep that system in place with the judges running things rather than switching over to the kings. But that didn't happen. You will remember that Israel begged God for a king, and he finally gave it to them. In fact, the change from the judges the kings is told about in this very book, 1 Samuel. Samuel himself would be the one who anointed the first two kings, first Saul and then David. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What we read here in chapter 2, uh, you might say this was the state of the union of Israel at the end of the Judges, and it wasn't a pretty picture at all. In fact, let's go back to the book of Judges itself for another description of how things were at the time. Turn back just a few pages to the very end of the book of Judges. We find it. Let's read the last verse in the book of Judges. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. <laughs> For the people of God, this is pretty sad. Uh, you've heard the saying, no news is good news. <laughs> Here's a case where no news from God is bad news. Now, getting back to 2 Samuel 2, what we read there is where God began setting in motion a plan to fix things. God did this sort of thing every so often, and sometimes his plan to fix things had to start with judgment. In this case, God sent a man it says, to talk to Eli about how things were going. That's in verse 27. What I find interesting is it doesn't give the man's name. He's just called a man of God. <laughs> you know, that reminds me sometimes these days, although I haven't heard it for a long time, but sometimes a pastor or a priest has been called a man of the cloth. You ever heard that? It's much better to be known as a man of God. And again, it doesn't say that this man was a prophet, but pretty much that's what he was because that's what he did. So I'm going to call him the prophet, if that's okay. He was one of several Old Testament prophets who, it doesn't 
give us their name. I say, praise God for those anonymous servants who were faithful to God, but were not world famous, you know, like Isaiah, Elijah, Paul, Peter. And in, and in some cases, like this guy, he, they just appeared once. They gave God's word once. In this case, the word of God to, to Eli, and then just disappeared from the Bible. Are we willing to serve anonymously, or do we think we need to be noticed for what we do? Anyway, this prophet came and laid it out straight to Eli, the priest. And as we read, the problem was corruption and immorality. And not only Eli himself, but especially his sons. What happened here? Did Eli do a bad job of raising his sons? Did they get into the wrong crowd at school? Uh, you know, well, again, corruption, immorality are always bad, but especially when it's the leaders. So the prophet, like many of the Bible preachers did, as this man spoke to Eli, he went back into history. In this case, he went back to the Exodus. When it says, your father here, uh, you see that several times in, in what we read. Where it says, your father, that wasn't Eli's dad. Uh, this father is Aaron, the father of all the priests. God chose Aaron and all the priests after him to do the sacrifices, which was, of course, an important part of the Old Covenant. But they had to be done right. The things they were commanded to do had to be done right. And part of it was that the law provided a way for the priests to be fed, <laughs> to eat. Uh, they were supposed to be supported by the offerings of the people. It was supposed to provide enough to eat, but presumably not to get fat like Eli and maybe his sons, completely abusing the system. Well, God's judgment would come quickly. The prophet said Eli's descendants would all die young, and it started with his two sons. Uh, we won't read it today, but in chapter 4, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, and both sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died that same day, just as the prophet had said. And Eli's own death shortly after that was even more pathetic. Yes, this was one of those really bad times in Bible history, but God always has a way of of making good come out of evil. Just ask the Old Testament Joseph. So here God had a plan for how to start fixing things. Actually, the plan had already started when the boy Samuel came to live there at Shiloh back in chapter 1. And then God called Samuel to serve. In chapter 3. Later on in the book, Samuel grew up. He became a great prophet, a great servant. This was the beginning of revival in Israel. Remember, um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, remember in those days the word of the Lord was rare at the beginning of chapter 3. Now let's look at you know, the first verse of chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. 
Samuel is one of my heroes in the Bible, a faithful servant for many years. Certainly not perfect, but faithful to God. Whenever God's people have let things run downhill for a while, God usually sets a plan in motion to pull his people back to himself and get the kingdom on earth <laughs> on track again. Now that's what happened here at the end of the period of the judges. Now I've never counted how many judges there were. Uh, you can go back and read that book, and you can find out. If, if you read the book, you will notice that the stories are all pretty much the same. The details are different, the people are different, but if you read it, you will find a certain pattern that runs through the time of the judges. Here's kind of how it goes. Israel becomes unfaithful to God. Israel's enemy attacks and wins the battle. Israel is oppressed by the enemy for a number of years. Israel cries out to God for help. God raises up a judge to deliver them from the enemy. The judge leads Israel to victory and revival. God, uh, Israel enjoys God's favor and prosperity for a period of time. And then after the judge dies, Israel forgets God and becomes unfaithful again. Over and over that happened during the time of the judges. But now a real change was coming. There wouldn't be any more judges. Samuel was now a real prophet. As I said earlier, uh, he, was an, he anointed the first two kings. God blessed Israel, especially under David and Solomon, and later on under some other good kings like Jehoshaphat and Josiah. And God has done that sort of thing in other times since then. You know, uh, since then. At the end of the Old Testament, there was a period of around 400 years that was something like this. When there was no prophet, there was no word from the Lord. Uh, Malachi was the last of the prophets, and then it was this time of 400 years. <laughs> Israel then became oppressed by the Romans, and they hoped for a Messiah who would come and deliver them. Suddenly, John the Baptist appeared and announced that Messiah was here. And what Jesus did on this earth was the single greatest thing that God did for his people after he created them. God didn't let the silence continue, but as John the Apostle wrote, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And God fixed what was wrong. Centuries later, there was another time when, well, different, but, you know, the same, only different. <laughs> uh, something kind of strange was happening in the Christian church. After a really a great beginning in the first four or five hundred years, the church started going downhill, what is sometimes called the Dark Ages. Now, of course, there were exceptions, but it seems like the, you know, many Christians and churches had lost their first love for God and for people. Instead, they were, they were all into, you know, building great cathedrals and and uh, building up their ecclesiastical hierarchy and of course with the clergy at the top and by the 15th century they did they were doing things like uh, selling indulgences so that people who had died 
could spend less time in purgatory, and some other things even stranger than that. But God, but once again, God provided a fix for the problem. People like Martin Luther and some others came along saying, wait a minute, where did all this stuff come from? Where do you find the sale of indulgences in the Bible? So it was back to the basics of the Christian faith, scripture only, Christ only, faith only, and so on. And again, draw, God drew his people back into a closer relationship with himself. This was the good news, that God is willing and eager to do this. Is it possible that we, and by we I mean the Christian faith, or uh, is it possible that we are in another time, like the time before Samuel, the time before John the Baptist, the time before the Reformation? Lord knows there are plenty of reasons to criticize the Christian church even today. Lots of ways where we've fallen short. In some cases, bad doctrine, immorality, lack of evangelism, conforming to the world. Is it possible that, that we're in another time where God needs to bring another revival or reformation, whatever you want to call it? Or maybe this time it will be Jesus himself coming back to fix things permanently as he promised. Whatever it is, whatever is needed, pray for God to do it. Amen. And maybe it's your own life that's gotten into a rut, or worse, if God is, um, God is certainly faithful, and sometimes he fixes things one person at a time. Do we need God to pull us back to himself? And if he does, will we come? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to your people. From the beginning of creation all the way to the end of time. And of course, that includes each one of us and, and our local congregation and the church all over the world and your whole kingdom everywhere. This is a time when we need your power to do your will. Thank you for the promise that if Jesus is lifted up, you will draw people to yourself. Do that among us, we pray. Revive us again. And as always, we ask through Christ. Amen.